Okay. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another session with Dental Shadowers. Today, we are joined with Dr. Vialta, who will be talking to us more about pediatric dentistry. Dr. Vialta, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much um, to Dental Shadowers for reaching out. I was just talking to the to the e-board, and this is such an amazing platform that you guys have created. It's very important, especially in these times of COVID, where I know a lot of people are interested in dentistry, um, but they just can't find the shadowing experience. Uh, so I just want to make this as valuable as possible. Um, if you have any questions, we'll save those to the end. I'm going to be sharing a lot of my cases, so that way you guys can see that it's more than just like brushing baby teeth. Um, and then I'll be sharing my like little advice here and there that I learned along the way. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to be part of this. Thank you guys. We're excited. <laughs> All righty. So how do I make this smaller? Sorry. Do you guys know how to, how, um, to make this window smaller? I'm not sure on that. I think is it the, it's like a default. I don't know. Do you put it right here? Yeah, is, it, is, it the, <laughs> is it the screen share itself or the? Um, I think it's mine, maybe. my own. It's okay. I'll just put it at the bottom. I'll just move it around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. So my name is uh, Dr. Jennifer Vialta. I am a pediatric dentist. I'm based out of Los Angeles, California. I am um, currently an associate dentist. Ooh, there we go. I'm currently an associate dentist. So I've been working now as a pediatric dentist for about a year and a half. Um, I, I've worked in all different um, types of dental offices, whether it be FQHCs, which is more like community-based dentistry, um, serving a lot of Medi-Cal, Dental patients here in California. Um, I've worked in private practice in Beverly Hills um, among very affluent, famous um, patients, and as well as in corporate, corporate environment, which I can touch on if you guys would like. Um, go on to the next slide. So I always like to start out with just kind of letting, letting everyone know my background so that you can see that all of this is attainable. Um, it is going to take time, perseverance, but you guys can do this. So never think like I've gotten a lot of messages about people who feel like they figured it out too late. They don't have enough experience. Um, they don't have good enough grades, what have you. And so I just want to kind of share my story. Um, I had to drop out of high school when I was 16 just a lot of stuff going on at home. Um, so I dropped out of high school at 16. I ended up moving in with my ex-boyfriend, my boyfriend at that time. Um, so I was just kind of like a little girl trying to figure it out. Thankfully, I had already started working at a dental office right as that transition was happening. So I was able to focus more um, on that experience that I was provided because, you know, I had to pay my, I had to pay for my rent, I had to pay for my car, my groceries, so all that stuff. So I worked full time at the dental office. Um, I started off as just doing sterilization. Uh, I would call and confirm patients. I would check insurances, whatnot. So very, very easy stuff. And then as my, um, my boss kept seeing that I was very interested in what I was doing, he offered to help me obtain my dental assisting license. So here in California, um, you can obtain your registered dental assisting license. I think the rules have changed since I um, originally was part of it. Um, but at that point in time, you could challenge the exam. So you challenge the clinical exam, which is to make temporaries, um, I think to put like a sedative filling or something like that. And then you also had a clinical exam. So I challenged both of those. I took some courses on the weekends just to help me because all I really knew at that point in time was the little bit I had learned from just assisting in the office. Uh, so I got my RDA license at 17. Um, I was working full-time during the day. So the only time that I could take classes at the junior college was at night. So that's why it took me about five years before I was able to complete all the prerequisites and finally transfer to UCLA. Uh, at UCLA, I spent two years there. I got my BS in physiological sciences. 
Um, it was an awesome experience while I was there. I tried to do as much as I could in the two years that I had there because most people have, you know, four years to do everything they have to do before applying to dental school. And so towards the end of my uh, senior year, I was kind of feeling super overwhelmed. Um, oh, I'm so sorry, this thing turned off. Ah. Um, at the end, sorry, as I was saying, at the end of my, my senior year in college, I was just feeling super overwhelmed, um, having to take the DAT, you know, I, I think I, I started the Kaplan course three times. Like, thank God they didn't charge me at each time, but it was just very overwhelming. I had two jobs at the time. So I decided to take a gap year, which I think was the most important thing that I could have done for myself. Um, burnout is a real thing. So I think always listening to yourself, listening to your body, listening to your mind, um, you always know what you need to do for yourself and trying to not just talk because everyone is going to try and tell you something that they think is best for you, but that may not be the best thing for you. So during my gap year, I went on two humanitarian missions. So this top left picture here, I was on this uh, ship. It's called the USNS Mercy Hospital ship. I was on that ship for about three months. And then I did another three month experience um, on a battleship. So in those six months, we traveled to Southeast Asia, the Pacific Islands to provide humanitarian care, particularly for me, um, dental care for people around the world who live in this re in, in really rural areas, no running water, no electricity. Um, it was an awesome experience. I learned a lot, but I think that's when I kind of started figuring out um, who I was and what I wanted to do long term. I always knew I wanted to go to dental school. That was just a goal that I had had since, you know, I started being a dental assistant. But during that time, I just saw that the, the dental disparities that we see here in the United States, uh, because I was an, a dental assistant, you know, in LA and South Central LA you see the same sorts of things in these countries that don't have running water, don't have electricity. And so that's when I really started figuring out like, hey, I really wanna be a pediatric dentist. I feel like that's gonna have the biggest impact to really addressing the number one most chronic disease in kids, which is cavities, dental cavities. So um, on my trip, I also backpacked with, uh, by myself for six months. So I got to, just experience all these different countries and meet all these new people and just kind of like absorb life, like smell the roses, which I hadn't been able to do this whole time that I was working and going to school. Um, I wrote my personal statement in Spain. Um, I, I finished like my CV while I was on the ship. We like cut in and out with um, internet. So it was a crazy time, but I'm really thankful for it. Um, I ended up getting into UOP, which is the only three-year institution in uh, the United States. And it was my top choice since um, before I even like really knew what it meant to apply to dental school. Um, so I was super thankful to get there. Uh, one of the reasons I really wanted to go there was because I already kind of knew I wanted to um, specialize. And so cutting a way that one extra year was really important for me because I was an older applicant once I started school. I started dental school when I was 28, which is, you know, usually people start early 20s. Um, after that, I went to residency at UCLA for pediatric dentistry, and I also obtained my master's in public health at the same time. Uh, so for UCLA, and every school is a little bit different depending on which residency you apply to, one, if they even have the public health master's available to you, and two, um, if you have to stay an extra year to complete it, or two years. Um, so thankfully for UCLA, it was simultaneously. I um, would go to school on the weekends, so Friday, Saturday, Sunday, 10 hours of lecture. It was crazy, but it was totally worth it. Um, so we'll move on to what is a pediatric dentist? Um, I, I really like this little, I made this little thing um, on the left, uh, but I saw it off of someone else. Um, I really like this because dentistry is so much more than just teeth. 
It's so much more than being a doctor, so much more um, than being an engineer, a nutritionist, a therapist, an investigator, a scientist, a teacher. You are, you are someone's best friend when they come see you, especially when you're a pediatric dentist. You create this amazing relationship with not just your patient, but also their entire family. So I find that super valuable. Um, I find that I can help a lot with engineering. Um, we look at cranial facial structure and development. So um, there's things that you can do with, for example, like orthodontics. When a child is very young, if they have like a crossbite, you can help alleviate that to help prevent any um, irregular growth, asymmetrical growth on one side versus the other. Um, so that's how I think we are really awesomely positioned to be engineers. Um, nutritionists, like I talk about food all the time, you know, stop eating sticky foods is like something I say to every single patient, stop eating these uh, gummy vitamins with sugar in them because they're just a glorified candy. So just really trying to figure out what your patient's nutrition is like and how you can help them. Um, I'm a therapist. I can't tell you how many times moms have cried um, because of things that are going, are going on at home that, you know, they, it, that goes into their kids' health. You know, there's sometimes I had one mom who has been battling cancer for a year and she feels so bad that now her child has all of these infections, but you know, they're dealing with their own stuff. Like we're all human. So being there um, and being a therapist for them is a really enjoyable part of my, of my life. Um, being an investigator, I love it. I love when you ask, you know, the mom, like how many times do you brush a day? And they give you all the right answers, but then the child will be the one saying like, no, mommy, I didn't brush last night or you let me have candy. Remember after? So things like that. It's really cool to like take everyone's uh, stories and then put them together and make your own story from everyone's input. Um, you're a scientist. You have to take all of these science classes, which sometimes you'll be sitting in organic chemistry lab and you're like, why are we doing this? But it all, it all come, it all comes full circle. It all makes sense. Um, we have to be scientists and then you're a teacher. You have to figure out, you know, what's the best way that I can communicate all this information to these patients so that they actually, um, take value in it and will embrace it and use it after they leave my, my office, because I only see them about twice a year. So all of the modifications they have to do at home has to do with how well I teach them. Um, and I find that to be really, really important and valuable. Um, and then the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, their definition of a pediatric dentist is that it's an age defined specialty that provides primary and comprehensive preventive and therapeutic oral health for infants and children through adolescence, including those with special needs. So special needs patients, um, we are very well trained in treating special needs, um, especially special needs patients who are, you know, a little bit older than a ch you would consider a child. Um, there's a huge disconnect between what happens with special needs patients after, you know, they turn into their teen years. And then uh, during that transition, when they have to find a general dentist, it's very hard to find a general dentist who wants to treat special needs patients. So it's really important um, for us to treat them and to help guide them into the next step of their dental journey. Okay, so now advice for college. I would say one of the biggest things uh, that's important is to be able to learn how you study best. Um, I think I, I'm still learning that, um, but I, I do know at this point that I study best learning things in a whole bunch of different ways. So not just visual, not just listening. Um, I actually have to do it myself. I always like joke, I'm kind of like a kid myself. I need tell, show, do. I need someone to tell me how to do it, show me how they do it. And then I have to do it and get corrected by them so that I can really learn it. Um, I'm not the type of person that can just learn. You know, I'm sure you guys have some of those people in your classes that they just, they see something, they hear something and they get it. I'm not like that. I need to like truly dive in deep and understand it so that I don't have to memorize it. Instead, instead, I like to understand it so that 
I never have to memorize anything. I just, it just makes sense, um, which I, I think physiology taught me that a lot. Um, another thing is getting involved in pre-dental societies, uh, doing things like you guys are doing with dental shadowers, just really like diving into, is this something that I want to get myself into um, so that you understand what is behind dentistry? Volunteering is very important. Um, I would say also don't just volunteer to volunteer like that, that actually you can kind of see that in someone's application when they're just doing things to do it. Um, actually like truly be passionate about the things that you're volunteering it in. And it doesn't always have to be in dentistry. Um, I did volunteer work teaching kids math in like um, low performing schools. So things like that where you're involving yourself in your community. If you want to do pediatrics, it would be best if you circled around like volunteering with children, um, but you don't have to do that. There's special Olympics that you can do. Um, there's give kids a smile day that you can do in the United States. So just kind of like look out for what things you can do. Um, I know that right now it's volunteer work as well as shadowing is really hard to find. So use things like social media um, to be able to do those volunteer hours that you need. So doing presentations for like mother's groups or stuff like that, that would be really valuable. You guys know a lot of stuff that they may not know that could really help them. What else did I put here? Uh, dental accounts with social media. It's really, you can learn so much just by going through Instagram and seeing what people do as a dentist or in different specialties. So I would say, take advantage of that. I never really like used um, social media until last year. I wish I had, because it would have been so much easier to learn how to prep a tooth. There, all you have to do is just type in a hashtag and you'll find it. Um, make a plan for like realistic plans for your, your DATs when you're going to study. Are you going to be tired after school? Are those really the days that you're going to be optimal at studying, um, making a plan for when you're going to apply, making a plan for how long you're going to give yourself to write your resume, um, finding your letters of rec writers, which I'll touch on a little bit more later. So just kind of having a plan of like, this is the due date, or this is the day that applications open. How do I get there? Um, because it's rolling admissions, even though I know sometimes they say it's, it's not rolling admissions. It really is. They're looking at your application off the bat and you don't know if they're putting those applications into different files off the bat. So be the first one there, make sure everything's clean, make sure you've had numerous people look over everything um, because it could really make someone feel some type of way if they're reading your application and there's typos. Like I off the bat, I don't like that. So just little biases like that, like just be aware of. Um, exploring things you like. So like I said, shadowing, volunteering. Um, myself, I worked in the School of Dentistry while I was at UCLA because I wanted to get to meet faculty and network and just already be in the space that I knew I wanted to be in. Um, dental assisting is really, really important. I think um, I brought a lot of knowledge to the table before I even came to dental school because of my dental assisting background. Um, don't compare yourself to other people. I think that's one big thing that we all struggle with is we see, oh, this person's doing this. I should be doing that. No, just have your own, your own plan of what you're going to do. Your journey is different from anybody else's. And if it works for them, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for you. So don't try not to compare yourself to other people. Um, and it's okay to take a growth year, a gap year. I think everyone's just so fixated right now on their goals that they've been having that they don't kind of like sit back and see if those goals are still something that they want to pursue. Um, so just make sure dentistry is what you want to get into. I would talk to as many people as possible. Um, I, I haven't been working. I have like this arm injury for like a month. Maybe if someone had really sat me down and told me how physically taxing dentistry would be for me, 
I may not have gone into pediatrics. I mean, probably not. I probably still would have done it, but I would have been more like cognizant of it during uh, my time in school. And I maybe would have looked into other fields. So just make sure that you take the time that you need to make sure you're going along the path that you really want to go towards. Okay, so now kind of looking at a typical day in my life. Um, so this is a, a picture of like a not so uh, busy schedule. Uh, usually the way that dentistry is broken up is you'll have one column of restorative treatment for pedi in pediatrics at least. And then you'll have two columns of patients who are either new patients who are coming into your office or you are having recalls. Some people call them profi appointments, um, cleaning appointments, hygiene appointments, what have you. Um, in busier offices, you're gonna see that the columns increase to about five columns per doctor. And these, um, these little appointments, these boxes are individual patient appointments. A lot of times those will be shortened to about 30 minutes. So this is, um, a pretty light schedule, just to give you a heads up. We have to see a lot of patients. So um, I'll just go over kind of like my first two hours in this particular day. So this patient right here is a restorative patient. All of my patients on the first column, I usually see um, restorative patients until an hour after lunch, um, just because in the afternoon you want to reserve those times for patients who are coming in after school to get their teeth cleaned. Um, who don't take as much time. Also for younger kids, I like to have their restorative appointments in the morning because behavior wise, they do best. So I'm not going to want to try and do a filling on a three-year-old after lunch. They're gonna be grumpy, it's their nap time. Um, so I, that's how I like to do it. There's other providers who like to see restorative all day. That's just not how I like to do things. Um, so initially this patient will come in, usually we'll use nitrous, which is laughing gas. We will use topical anesthetic, which will help kind of like numb the tissues before we give the injection. And then we'll give the injection so that you can achieve local anesthesia. And then I will leave this patient with my assistant. And then I will go see this patient here, who is more than likely uh, a new patient. So by the time I get here, hopefully my assistants have already taken them back. They have gotten the radiographs that I've already asked for, because um, I come in around 30 minutes before I start my day to just go over my schedule and to put any like um, things that I need them to, to do. If I'm not available, they can see what, what I need. Um, hopefully by that time they'll have the cleaning done and then I can come in and do my exam. I can do my treatment planning. I can discuss all the findings with the parents. And then hopefully by that time, this patient's feeling good. If they were crying after the local anesthesia, then by the time I come back, hopefully they're a little more calm. I will do my restorative treatment. I will say goodbye and then I'll go to this patient. So it just kind of is like a little ping pong throughout the day. Um, and the hard, the hard part is when you are, you know, running behind, inevitably you're going to have a patient that maybe has a more extensive medical um, history that you really need to talk to the parent about. So having a good team is really important, a good trained team so that you can stay on schedule and they can help you throughout the day because it's not, I couldn't do anything I do without my team. Like there's the front desk, there's the insurance coordinator, there's a scheduler, um, so all those people play a really integral role in us being able to stay on time and see our patients. Uh, this right here is kind of like the setup of my regular, like restorative appointment. I'm really big on doing whatever it is that that patient will allow me to do. I may have something planned in the schedule, but if that patient, you know, it's just not their day, their they're not having it today, then I like to have backups of things that I'm going to do. You know, if, if I thought I was going to be able to do a filling and maybe I can't do a filling, then I will use something called SDF, silver, silver diamine fluoride. I like to have that in the room just in case. I like to have um, temporary restorative materials in case the kid, you know, flips out and I can't do a regular filling 
um, because of the environment being, you know, full of saliva, debris, whatnot. Um, so I, I like to be super prepared for whatever it is that the patient may need. Um, so that's kind of what it looks like when we set up for our patients. Uh, another thing that we do is we do something called IVGA, intravenous general anesthesia, which is usually uh, for kids who are a little, who are pretty young, um, who have, who just can't get their treatment done um, in a regular setting with nitrous. They just won't allow it. Excuse me for one second. My, my uh, computer is about to die. Let me just plug it in. All right, there we go. Um, where was I? Oh yeah, full mouth dental rehabilitations. Um, or kids who maybe are cooperative-ish, but they just have every single quadrant of the mouth that needs restorative treatment. I usually will let the parents choose if, if I feel like, hey, I'm, I'm more than willing to try to see if they can sit through all this treatment. Um, but there's some kids that as you, as you see more and more patients after residency, after being out, you know, for um, a few years, you kind of know, like, this patient's not going to let me do all this treatment. It's just best to have them go take a nap for a little bit and do all of their restorative treatment. And they wake up and they're still happy patients. They still like coming to the dentist as opposed to inflicting, you know, all of these psychological traumas on kids. Um, some kids get papoosed. They get tied down to have their dental treatment done. If they're crying and screaming, they're not breathing the nitrous. And so really they're just fully aware of everything that's going on. And those are the kids that come back and they are phobic of the dentist. And I'm sure you guys will have those patients as adults. So if you can just keep that from happening, you'll help them so much more later on. Um, some of the things that I um, see a lot are traumas. They're the chief complaints of the patients are that they have fallen. Um, this little girl fell, I think she was playing at the park. And so they came in and we did a little filling for her because um, she was having sensitivity when she was drinking cold stuff um, and breathing, talking. Uh, another patient came in. He, uh, he actually didn't know he had done this, but he bit his tongue because I saw him a few weeks after to just make sure it healed. So that was another trauma that he had. I think probably while he was eating, um, he got some soft tissue trauma. Another thing that I see um, a lot is patients who come in with extra oral or intra oral swellings like this. This occurs because you've had an accumulation of an infected to the infection from an infected tooth. It just kind of gets contained in this environment and it has no way out. And so it just kind of builds up and then you get a huge um, swelling or abscess. So for those patients, I will tend to give antibiotics for, wait for the swelling to go down a little bit before we extract. Um, but if it's one of those situations where I know I don't have an appointment, you know, in the near future for them, then I'll opt to do that the same day or if they're in pain. So it's case by case for each patient. This is um, something that we do a lot in pediatric dentistry. These are called anterior strip crowns. Um, sometimes we can also do full coverage zirconia crowns, which are a lot more expensive. Um, it just depends on what type of office you're in. Um, I got trained to do strip crowns, so I really like, I enjoy doing them, um, but I also do zirconia crowns as well. So this patient is, this is how they initially presented. They had gone to another dentist. Um, so they tried to do like, I call them band-aid uh, restorations, where they just kind of put a little bit of like temporary material there, um, but they weren't able to accomplish it with the other teeth. And the child was was getting kind of bullied by, by his friends and his, his cousins. And so it was something that made him feel really insecure. And that was the mom's chief concern was fixing that. So, um, we under general anesthesia, we, we prepare the teeth. So we get everything nice and isolated with a rubber dam. 
with all these little flossers and then we remove the decay so you can see the difference between this guy and this guy and these are the preforms that we use we fill those with composite and so after we clean we etch we bond then you place that little strip on you use a curing light to cure it so that the material hardens and then after um, this is what they look and then you go back and do a little bit of like manicuring underneath the gums to make sure you don't have excess composite that can later on um, lead to in gingival inflammation that bothers the patient, or it could be a trap for food. And so this is what it looked like after. And he was super happy. I usually like to do post-ops. So about two weeks later, I'll see my patients who've undergone general anesthesia just to make sure everything looks good, to make sure that they're um, improving with their oral hygiene, because studies have shown that within that year after a patient has to undergo general anesthesia for dental treatment when they're so young, they will get a new cavity. So it's very important for me to keep them on a short recall to make sure they're you know, staying on top of the diet modifications and the oral hygiene modifications. This is um, a patient that I had, she was, or she is 17 or 18 years old. Um, she had infections on all of her back molars and she's a very anxious patient. So we just had to really take it slow. The first time I met her, I, I couldn't even put gloves on, you know, it was just too scary for her. So we did, we, I, I'm really, I love just catering to each patient. They're all very unique and very different. And, you know, she needed nitrous to be able to let us look and do a cleaning and then diagnose. And then little by little, every time she came in, she, she became like the easiest patient to treat um, because she's so high risk with her cavities, because she just, for whatever reason, cannot seem to brush twice a day or even once a day. And it's something that she, there's familial history of dental disease, dad when I first met him, I think he had just gotten all of his teeth extracted and had temporary dentures in. So I already in my head, I'm like, I'm not super trusting that this patient is going to be able to stay cavity free with just um, composite fillings. Also, they're pretty large. And so I opted to do um, stainless steel crowns for the back molars for her adult teeth, which some people do, some people don't do. Um, these little guys right here, these little blue donuts are separators. They, I like to place them about a week before we do restorative treatment. You, um, they fill up with saliva. So they stay in the mouth. They fill up with saliva. They make space between the teeth. So that way, when we're doing our removal of decay and we're preparing the tooth for the final restoration, I don't have to remove as much tooth structure um, because tooth structure is very valuable, especially for adult teeth it makes them strong. So I want to keep as much of that as possible. So that way, when she is able to improve her oral hygiene, she's older, she's in her mid twenties, she can have these replaced um, by a general dentist with some really nice uh, crowns. And so that way, hopefully the general dentist won't be upset with me that I took away too much tooth structure or that I um, place their margins super low because that could be really hard for them to restore later on. Okay, so now we're going to move on to dental technology. So one of the things that we um, love in pediatric dentistry are digital radiographs. It's real time. You're able to take pictures with less radiation for the, for the patient, and then you're able to see your pictures automatically. Um, there's different buttons that you can enhance the contrast. You are able to detect um, things a lot easier with that, as opposed to like an old school film. So um, this is a picture, this big picture is a panoramic radiograph. We usually take these at around the age of seven when the first molars have fully er have uh, erupted. And um, this patient was, I want to say nine. Um, he had never had a panoramic radiograph taken and I took one and I'm like, hey, what's that? 
And then um, we took a periapical radiograph that showed this area a little bit more enhanced. And then you can see right here, um, this patient has a mesial dens, which is um, an extra tooth. And so we referred them to oral surgery. I think they're still in the process of figuring out um, if they're gonna proceed with treatment or what's going on with that due to finances. But this is something that we, we use a lot in pediatric dentistry. Um, there's different types of radiographs that you can take that are digital. You can use phosphor plates, which are very flexible and thin. Um, they're really, really cool to use for pediatric patients because they're just a lot tinier. Um, there's also the, the bigger blocks that you can use that attach to the computer. And um, those are a little bit bigger for pediatric patients, um, but it just depends on what your what you like to use or what's in your office. And as an associate, you really don't have much say. You just kind of use whatever's uh, whatever is available. Um, but it's it's it would be nice to have an option of using both um, because sometimes for some kids they can't use one um, and they can use the other one a lot easier. For the next topic, um, diagnostic tests and instruments that we use. So I kind of showed you guys um, a periapical. This was a part of a bite wing, but you can see this is what it looks like um, in clinically. And then here you can see all of this gray area right here. That's all infection. It's all loss of material. So that's why it looks darker. And you can see right here, that's the nerve of the tooth. So this was already into the nerve of the tooth. And you can see some other decay going on here, which is this guy right here. Um, so radiographs are super important when it comes to diagnosing and treatment planning. This right here um, is a setup. I think we were having um, IVGA this day. And um, these are all my stainless steel crowns. So let's say I'm restoring this tooth. I have to go through a few sometimes of sizes just to make sure that I find one that fits the best. And so that's why we always have that box there. Um, this is our rubber dam. It's all set up. This for, these instruments right here are for extraction. Um, this is composite. This is our cement that we use to cement the stainless steel crowns. This is a little pad that we use to mix everything. Uh, my local anesthesia setup. This is my light cure to help harden uh, the fillings that we do. And this is sealant. Um, and then there's more. This right here is chlorhexidine and sodium hypochlorite. So this, if we're doing pulp treatments, um, we will use one or the other. I'm not sure why they had both of them out there. Um, but I, I tend to like to use chlor, or I tend to like to use sodium hypochlorite more. Um, but again, it just depends on the offices that you go to if they have one or the other. And we're going to go over some important terms in pediatric dentistry or in just dentistry in general. So for pediatric teeth, they are named according to um, letters. So you start on the top right, that's A, B, C, all the way to, oh, I'm sorry, that says J, that should have said T all the way to T down here. And then for permanent teeth, it starts one, two, three on the top right. And then it goes all the way around to 32. Um, if people have extra teeth, then they're, they're numbered accordingly. Um, so that's kind of like the difference between adult, uh, adult teeth and um, primary or baby teeth. And then another thing that um, we use terminology wise a lot is the position of the tooth that you're talking about. Because even though, yes, you already know, okay, they're talking about um, number, let's say 30 on the bottom right. There's different parts to that tooth. So there's a mesial part, which is um, the, the part closest to the midline of the face. There's the distal part, which is the part that's closest to the throat. There's incisal, which you use the word incisal, and you can see here for the front six teeth, which are your incisors. But when you get to your posterior teeth, you use the word occlusal, which is this part here for the back uh, premolars, bicuspids, or the molars. 
And same thing goes with facial and buckle. Facial technically is for the anterior teeth and then buckle is more for the posterior teeth. And then pits and fissures are really important for us. Um, we do a lot of sealants for um, permanent molars. I personally do sealants for baby teeth when I see that they are starting to get cavities just to seal, to entomb whatever infection is in there, whatever bacteria is in there. If you remove the source of carbohydrate for that bacteria, then it should die. Um, but you can't, obviously you can't do that for all cases. This is case by case. Um, you have to tactfully feel, you know, how active is this little pre-infection and um, make your assessment if you feel like it's good to either do a filling on it or if it's better to just do a sealant. This is um, another case that I had during, uh, what was this patient? I forget if this patient was awake or not, um, but you can see here, this, these are the infections that the patient presented with, the cavities on S and on T, which is the lower right, first and second primary molars. So after we removed the infection, um, I think on these two teeth, I went on to do pulp treatments. And then after that, we placed stainless steel crowns, um, the same type that I was showing you before on the adult case, but they are for baby teeth. My next case, um, I love this case. This case is of ectopically erupting permanent molars. So ectopically erupting molars, usually what happens, um, this happens because the, pace, the patient doesn't have enough space in their mouth for the teeth to grow in correctly. And so you can see this angulation of the top right first molar. It has started to resorb this top right baby molar. And so what a lot of people will um, tend to do is just extract this tooth. But I've seen so many cases where after you extract this tooth and you don't really do anything, this permanent molar completely comes in and takes over the space of this tooth. And so later on, when the patient has their premolars that are ready to come in, there's no space for them. And it is so hard, if not impossible, to move this tooth back once that has happened. And so you end up putting the patient in a position where more than likely they're going to have to need permanent teeth extracted when really if you had just made space for that corrected it you could have saved that patient a lot of money a lot of headache um, in trying to figure out how to fix that later on so the patient presented with this uh, permanent molar stuck ectopically erupting on the distal part of this upper right A, which is the second primary molar. And so what I did was I designed this little, it's called a Halterman appliance, um, but I just kind of made it my own. Um, usually you would want these bands to be placed on the second molars, but because I was nervous that this patient was going to lose that tooth there, I wasn't, um, I didn't feel confident of placing it on that one. So I went ahead and I placed it on the two primary first molars. And then you can see here the finished product. Uh, there's a little button that you bond. So it's, it's cemented to the permanent tooth. And then right here, there's a little chain, a little power chain that you use. It's a plastic power chain. And so you engage the two. And then the patient comes in every month, every two months, um, whatever the philosophy of the dentist is, and they change that little power chain. So here you can see that this was the first time he came in and I placed it. And then he came in the second time. And then I think he came in two or three times. And then the last time I saw him, you can see that that's already corrected. Um, there's the tooth there. Uh, sorry, I didn't put the, the latest picture, but this tooth is actually erupted and this part right here is now right here. And there's a space between the baby tooth and the adult tooth. So it's a really cool appliance. It took less than three months to do and it saved a lot of headache for this patient later on. This is um, a patient who came in super sad. Um, this patient had already been told three times that they needed to have all of this dental treatment taken care of and that the patient is so combative that we cannot do this treatment with him awake. 
the mom refused and um, every time. And of course she hadn't shown up for about a year or so. And he comes in with uh, swelling, extra swelling on both sides. And then when you look inside, the picture doesn't do it justice, but, but he's just inflamed everywhere. And so um, again, the patient is still very combative. He needs a lot of dental treatment. He's already lost, I think all of his anterior teeth. And so, um, you know, I gave her the same recommendations again, but now she wants to get the treatment done. But unfortunately, because she waited so long, um, we had already received approval from the insurance to proceed with the treatment. That approval expired. And so now we have to start the whole process over. And um, in that meantime, all we can really do is provide antibiotics for these kids. And you see this a lot in the residencies, in the hospitals that these kids are seen in, there's like a six month to a 12 month waiting list for them to get treated under general anesthesia sometimes. So um, it's, it's really important. It's really important how you educate your patients so that they can understand like, hey, if this happens, our hands are kind of tied because I have a list of all these other patients that have had the same issue as you and they're waiting. So um, we need more pediatric dentists, you guys. So I hope this convinces you to, to look into the field. Um, going over some advice that I had, um, I've talked about this before, asking for letters of recommendation super early. So when I was at the end of my first year in dental school, so UOP again is, is a three-year program. So you kind of have to decide early if you want to specialize. I made sure that when we had our pediatric rotation, which was about a month, that I made sure that I engaged with the program director, that he knew my interest in pediatrics and that I came and I shadowed um, at the dental clinic, which I think might be a little bit harder nowadays, but you just have to be, um, you have to just figure out a different way to do it. Like maybe emailing them and just letting them know and letting them know, Hey, I know with that pandemic, everything is different, but is there anything that you would recommend I do to make sure that I'm on the right track, um, for applying to pediatrics or whatever other specialty you guys want to, um, go into? I made sure that I, created relationships with the people that I felt like I vibed with, um, not just because I was preparing to ask them for a letter of recommendation, but there's just those people that you really, you want them to take you under your wing. And so I just made sure that I gravitated towards those types of people that wanted to mentor me and um, understood my background and wanted to see me succeed. After I kind of figure it out, like these are the people that I'm going to ask to write my letter of recommendation. You want to make it as easy as possible for them to write you this letter, because more than likely, you're not going to be the only person that's asking them. And so if you make it easier for them and you kind of like wow them off the bat, like imagine how much better your letter of recommendation is going to be. Um, so I always made sure that I, I looked them in the eye and I asked them like, can you, do you feel confident in writing me a strong letter of recommendation? And if they even like hesitated, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like proceed with like asking them because I've read, um, some letters of recommendations that maybe the applicant thought they had a really good one and they just get bashed on the letter of recommendation. And that just like is an automatic like X on your application. Like no one's going to want to give you an interview if you have a letter of recommendation, especially not from like a program director, you know, in your school or someone who's high up. Um, so just make sure it's going to be a strong letter. I started off with a cover letter where I described initially the importance of the letter of recommendation. Um, I included in there like statistics, this is how many people applied last year for pediatrics. This is how many people got in. Um, these are the schools I'm applying to. This is how hard, how competitive it is for me to get into these schools that I applied to. These are the deadlines. Um, I kind of fudged the deadlines a little bit. I made them sooner than they really were to make sure that I got my letters in on time because your application is not complete until everyone's stuff is in, whether it's your stuff or someone else's stuff. 
Um, and then I, I showed, I made a list of what residencies I was applying to. And then in another paragraph, I wrote what program directors were looking for in a letter of recommendation. Honestly, you guys, you can just Google this, do your research. One thing that I used, um, it's in the next slide, but I, um, UCSF has a really good um, online sources for letters of recommendation, for personal statements, for CVs, examples. They break it down for you in color. Um, I'll show you some examples after. So just making sure you're making it easy for them to write you a letter of recommendation. So I just wrote probably like 15 bullet points. Like these are the things they wanna look for. My qualifications, how teachable am I? How mature I am, my demeanor in clinic, my uh, their personal experiences with me. Um, am I someone who takes initiative? Am I reliable? Am I able to accept their criticism? Um, so those are the things that I wrote on there so that they could be like, oh yeah, Jen dis uh, displays this, not so much that. So um, take off whatever you feel like you don't display because you don't want them to think, oh, she doesn't have that. Um, so in that packet that I gave them after I knew like this letter writer is gonna be an awesome letter writer. I provided the cover letter with all that information I just said, my CV, my personal statement, which I was still working on. So it was, it was a rough draft. And then my transcript, um, cause it was important for me uh, that they knew where, where I was in the rank um, at UOP. We were ranked according, you know, one to however many people were in the class. So it was important for me that they saw like where I was in that um, because you tend to want to be in the top third if you're applying for specialties. Um, writing your personal statement, start writing it early. Um, I think I got like tons of ideas and then I just wouldn't write them down. And then when I would sit down to finally like work on my personal statement, I just went blank. Um, I can't tell you how many times I like tried to write and like nothing would come out. Um, I think for me, I, everyone's journey is different, but I like to be in really good environments. So I like nice looking um, environments. So like I said, I was in Spain when I wrote my dental school personal statement. Um, I was in my mom's backyard on a hammock drinking a beer when I wrote my residency personal statement. Um, so just whatever that place is for you that makes you feel inspired, I would go to that place and just sit down and, you know, take it as like, this is going to be so fun to write this story as opposed to like as homework. Um, Cause this is honestly the reason why I didn't submit early for residency is because of this. I, I just, it took me so long to write mine. Um, you don't want, you want to elaborate. You want a story. Just like, think about like, what would you want to read from someone who's applying and you're reading their personal statement? Um, you don't just want to regurgitate your CV or your resume. That's so boring. And we already read that in your resume or your CV. So just like elaborate, like if you wrote in your resume that you did give kids a smile for five years, like say that, like, say like your most, um, vivid memory. So that way we know whoever's reading your application, like this person really wants it. And we really want to meet this person. You want them to read your personal statement and then want to hang out with you after. Um, this is going to take you time. I would recommend that you don't think that you're going to get it on the first shot, second shot, third shot. I think I wrote mine like 20 times. I would make sure that tons of people read your personal statement, not just people in dentistry, but people outside of dentistry too. They can have a lot of good input. And also not everyone who's looking at your applications is a dentist. So keep that in mind too. Um, having an outline is really important. Um, I'm sure you guys have felt the same when you read something and you're kind of like, where is this going? What's the point of this? Like, make sure each word that you write on paper, there's a reason for that word. You don't want to waste words or sentences. Um, have an outline. And then yes, the UCSF Office of Career and Professional Development. I used a lot of their resources. Um, I can show you guys, where is it? 
This is one that I use. Can you guys see this? No, um, we're still looking at your PowerPoint. How do I share this? I Are you on your? I'm on my you, computer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you probably have to like um, minimize the PowerPoint. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. If I can figure it out fast. Can you see it now? Oh, it minimized the whole. No, we're still looking at your PowerPoint. Okay, Do you have two mind. monitors by chance? No, I wish I was that cool. Oh, no. <laughs> I was asking because sometimes it like shows one monitor over the other. So I was going to suggest like moving things over, but. It doesn't. Oh, well. But yeah, if you go on that website, um, it has a lot of good tools. That's where I got um, this whole idea of like creating a, a little like folder for your letter writers. Um, and then please don't copy other people's personal statements or their CVs. It's super embarrassing when like someone comes across something they already saw, like that makes you look so bad. And also if that person finds out, like you probably lost a friend through that. Um, this, so yeah, this environment's really small. Um, and then in closing, advice for you guys, uh, same thing I said before, kind of, everyone's unique, like don't compare yourself to other people, your journey is unique, it's special, it's yours, like whatever, whatever goals you have, those are your goals, and you're going to accomplish those however it is you're supposed to, don't compare yourself to other people and how they did it, because you're not them, you have a completely different life. Um, and throughout your journey, just don't forget to smell the roses. I think for a long time, I just became super fixated on my grades and like doing all this volunteer work and working and all this stuff that I, that's why I burnt out. Like, that's why I needed a gap year, you know? So enjoy yourself, like make sure you surround yourself with good people. Um, planning for success is part of that. I think having a group of people who support you and who are like your cheerleaders when you get an A on your test or are your cheerleaders when you get an F on your test, like you need those people in your life. If those people are not giving you that energy, then they're taking energy from you. Like you don't need them in your life. You have too many things to focus on than to focus on that negativity. Um, finding and keeping mentors, like reach out to people, especially people who have already done what you want to do. Um, don't, if you guys have any questions for me, like I'm always open, um, but I think mentors are awesome. I have tons of mentors. One of my friends put it really, really great. She said, you wanna have mentors in each stage of the places that you want to be. So I have mentors who are like, even in the same, uh, they've been out for the same amount of time I've been out. I have mentors who have been out for five years. I have mentors who've been out for 10, 20 years who are like retired. So each of those people will help you so much. And we truly, truly, truly like want to uplift because, you know, we've already gotten to a certain point. So that's why I'm here, like doing this presentation, because I just want to give you guys um, advice that I wish someone had given me. So make sure you guys do that. Um, if you're in dental school, make sure you reach out to like the pre-dental society and help those kids out. Like, how do I get to dental school or like middle school, like teach them what it like they can be a dentist too. Um, I think that's really important and it's going to make your, your life so much more rewarding. So thank you guys. Um, I think we're going to answer questions now. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, um, reached 10 p.m. right now but okay. we can go ahead and answer a few questions if if you don't mind yeah of course okay great awesome we do have a few questions um so the first one I have is can you speak more to the physical strain of being a dentist what parts of the body do you feel are most affected and how much does this affect your quality of life um, I can speak to that so much because I have this awesome brace. I have tennis elbow apparently um, and golf golfers, golfers elbow too. Um, 
that dentistry in general is very taxing on your body. Um, the number one reason why we retire early in dentistry is because of musculoskeletal issues. Mm -hmm. And I think that starts from like being in dental school, um, maybe even before that, like how you study, you know, some of us study super hunched over and like, that's just where we're comfortable. And like, we know we shouldn't be studying like that, but we keep doing it. That's how I was. I would study in my bed during dental school. Like that's so bad for you. Um, so just being very cognizant of your ergonomics, especially when you start getting into dental school and you're in, in sim lab in, in, um, I don't know if everyone calls it sim lab, but when you're learning how to do all these, all these restorations and preparations, just make sure you focus on your body, um, how you're sitting in your chair. You should be all the way back. You should have back support. Um, you should, your, your, um, your thighs should make an angle that's slightly down, shouldn't be up. You shouldn't be putting your, your feet. Like if you have a little ring around your chair, don't put your feet on that. That just creates extra pressure in areas that you don't want to create pressure. Um, your hands, I call them my money makers because they are, um, <laughs> making sure that you're not gripping super hard, which I'm su a, such a hard gripper, um, making sure that you are not straining your hand like this to do treatment, like make sure that you have it, um, the least amount of strain on your body, um, uh, making sure that you take the time to teach your team how they can help you. So like little repetitive movements, like me reaching for the light, I shouldn't do that. Like, because this is injuring me every time I do this, mm -hmm. um, when you're prepping and going like this, that is hurting your neck so much and all the other muscles associated with it. It's weakening them. So if you, one time you go to reach for something, it can spasm on you and then make your entire hand numb. So just being really cognizant of your ergonomics. Uh, I think it also depends on what specialty you go into pediatrics is very physical. I'm pulling my kids all the time up the chair, which I'm going to stop doing. Um, but you know, there's certain kids that just require you to hold them as you're drilling. That's a lot of strain on your body. So I think looking at like, realistically, how many days a week do you want to work? How many hours a day do you want to work? Um, it's hard on your body. I'm not going to lie and say it's not, but I think ergonomics is like so huge and making sure that you look at all those repetitive motions that you do and try and limit them as much as possible and using your team, like four-handed dentistry is so important. Like your assistant being aware of what's going on and what the next step is, because that instrument that you need should be right there. As soon as you're like, I'm ready for the next thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so I hope, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Like even like your office chair, you spend the most time in and like, you need a good one. <laughs> exactly. Oh my gosh. Some of these offices I've worked at, like the chair, the, the chair goes like this. I'm like, <laughs> this is so bad for my body. <laughs> <It is. laughs> oh man. Um, the next question is, how do you best prepare your body for physical strain of daily tasks? I think you kind um, of answered the same. Yeah, I would say yoga is really important. Stretching is really important. Just being active, uh, making sure that you are allowing the blood to circulate. I love running and biking. Haven't been able to do that recently, so I could feel it in my must in my body. Mm -hmm. um, but just being as active as possible. That's also going to give you more endorphins so that you can be happier during dental school. And after, um, I would say like being as physical as possible and like having a routine, um, because if you don't do it for a long time, you're going to feel it in your body. So mm -hmm. taking care of yourself, if you are feeling something that doesn't feel right, like I would seek care for it. Mm -hmm. Um, I would make sure that um, like me, I used to sleep like this. So I now I sleep with a wrist guard so that I don't do this. Cause this is really, I'm already putting a lot of, a lot of stress on my wrist throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't be doing that at night or like any other times that I'm not, um, 
doing restorative treatment or seeing patients, I'll wear it too. So just being like very aware of your body and like seeking advice if something is like starting to not feel great. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, for sure. And so like a- another question is how do you handle anxious patients? And um, this kind of also deals with the same topic, kind of knowing that children can sometimes get fussy and become difficult to work with. What motiva- motivates you to tr- choose to pursue pediatric dentistry rather than general or any other specialty? So it kind of goes hand in hand. Yeah, um, I love a challenge. Like I look at anxious patients or like standoffish like families as a challenge. Like I want them to to like me. I want the, I want to be able to help them through their appointment. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that for me is really rewarding for someone else that may not be rewarding. So I think looking at like what it is that you like, cause you're going to do the best if you're doing something that you love. Um, how do I deal with anxious patients? I honestly, as soon as I walk into the room, I ignore everybody, but the patient So I say, hi, hi, little Jen, you know, like, I love your shoes, you know, like, I create a rapport with them off the bat, like I ignore their parents, which is so not normal to them. And you can see like, I can see out of the corner of my eye, like the mom being like, what, you know, and off the bat, you're already starting off on a good foot, as opposed and I don't I'm usually never wear my white coat. I just feel like they get more um, white coat syndrome. Like they're just scared. They think, especially if they just got their vaccines last week, they're not going to want to hang out with me without crying. So I try and do little things like that. Um, I don't just go straight to the teeth. I'm like, Hey, let's pick, let's pick a show together. You know, like what's your favorite show, you know, just trying to make it so that they don't feel like they're at the dentist, Mm -hmm. um, with patients who are anxious, nitrous helps a lot. Um, being very like, let you go from one step to the next. So if it's a little kid and they're just scared, then, Hey, let's see if you can get on the chair. Cool. You got on the chair. Can I put the chair back? If they lose it, that's fine. Like I'll just do my exam like this. And then next time when I see you, your pinky promise, like we're going to put the chair back. I'll make a note like, Hey, did not let me put the chair back. So the next time, like, I always want to make sure that they're like growing each appointment. So the next time the chair is going to be back, Mm -hmm. mom's not going to be holding them. So just like little incremental steps, um, tell, show, do goes a long way. So I tell them what I'm going to do. I show them, I let them touch everything, obviously not the local anesthesia. That's like, rainbows and butterflies they never know that's happening um or they shouldn't know um what else do i do i talk a lot (laughs) i i blab about anything i make up stories as we're drilling like i just try and get them out of the zone of like i'm at the dentist getting my tooth filled or my tooth extracted so like right as i'm about to extract a tooth i make sure that I engage them in something that's like completely not, um, what's going on. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. It helps a lot. And then telling parents not to show them or tell them things. Mm -hmm. Um, cause there's some parents, believe it or not, who will go on YouTube and like, let them see, this is a dental extraction. I'm like, why did you do that? (laughs) <laughs> They're scared once they come in, you know, yeah. um, another thing I do a lot is having, um, a desensitizing appointments. So if I know I have a very anxious child, mm-hmm. then I'll make sure I make, uh, appointments that are shorter frequency so that they can just come in and have a good, easy appointment. So that if we are trying to work up to restorative treatment, like they've had two or three easy appointments. So then like, we're, we're good friends at this point and they'll allow me the, to do the treatment later on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those are all really nice techniques and very useful when it comes to kids. Uh, Yeah, and so another question was, what was your whole motivation for getting a a MPH? 
while also doing a residency? And then another follow-up question to that would be, are there any specific skills you transferred from your MPH to your practice? Um, I really wanted to get my MPH since I like kind of figured out like what MPH was. Um, I'm first generation Latina. My fam, like we grew up super poor in South Central LA. So it's really important for me to like give back to my community. Mm -hmm. And I know that later on, I want to go into like policy. I want to just try and restructure our, our oral health system. I think it's kind of broken. But in order for you to get into those spaces, you have to have those degrees. And so that was like my first stepping stone, as well as kind of like understanding um, public health as a whole. Like, why do we have insurance? Why does insurance not really work um, in 2021? Um, the history behind everything worldwide like what you see so I was really interested in that I didn't really know what I could do with it later on it wasn't something that I was trying to monetize on I just I'm truly 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 passionate about it mm -hmm. so I only applied to residencies that could provide that for me um do I use it in my everyday practice I used it a lot last year um mm -hmm. I think I was the one who told my employer like we need to shut down. <laughs> we can't keep seeing patients. And they're like, you're crazy. You're overreacting. And probably within like a week we were shut. Everyone was shut down around the world. And it was just because of my MPH background. Like I was able to do the research on my own. I was able to know like, who do I look to for advice or, um, information on this. Uh, they had already published a lot of papers, you know, about it by the time it got here. So just kind of having that like global mindset is I think what the MPH provided me um, mm -hmm. in that respect. Do I use it every day? Probably not really. Um, I understand a lot more about access to care. And I think it makes me an, a more empathetic provider. But do I use it every day? No, potentially in the future, I could use it more depending on if I want to go into like running my own uh, public health clinic or like I was saying, going into lobbying, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I personally, I wouldn't say that I, I use my MPH. I use parts of it, um, but not, not currently in more than just that. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. We're gonna do two more questions. Um, it's gonna be, so have you found that more people are taking gap years or a more untraditional route rather than going straight through to dental school? So I think like he's asking like, have you seen a trend in that? Or if you have any advice to people who are doing that maybe? Yeah, I mean, I can't really speak on like globally. I think people should take time. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think it's kind of weird that we like expect our kids to know by the end of high school what you want to do with your life. Even by the end of like college, you're, you're like in your early twenties. Mm -hmm. um, I think it should be something that people do more freely. Other countries, it's just part of their culture. Like mm -hmm. um, Australia, Europe, it's just. Part of the culture like you're going to take six months to a year off to explore the world and see other cultures see how other people live um, have a more global understanding of the human race so I definitely think everyone should take a gap year um, I also think you should do something with that gap year because they will ask you in your interviews what did you do in your gap year why did you take gap year so um for me, having that, like the six months that I did volunteering, mm -hmm. I had so many stories to share about that. Um, so they saw like, hey, she didn't just take a gap year to party. Like, I mean, I did a little bit, but I, I did other things with that time too. Um, I think it's a really good way to like reset mentally. Like I said, just really figuring out like, is this something I want to do? Or is it something that I've just, it's been a goal and like, I'm gonna achieve it no matter what just really like honing in. Um, it's a good time to save money if you can work because dental school is expensive and living is expensive and eating out is expensive. 
Yeah. So I would definitely recommend take that gap year and, um, but just have a plan as to how you're going to use it. Gotcha. For sure. I think we can end it on this question. How do you balance your time, your work with family and friends? How do I balance my time? Um, I, <laughs> I'm just kind of like, I always like to do everything. I have FOMO and I have like all of these goals in my life that I know that if I'm not continuously like working towards everything, like I'm never going to achieve it. Mm -hmm. I also appreciate my free time a lot. Mm -hmm. So I think during the week I grind pretty hard, like at work, um, come home and I work on my like personal growth. And then I have time on the weekends to hang out with my friends, um, mm -hmm. to just kind of like help me decompress to, talk about like our goals and like, Hey, how can we all help each other reach those goals? Um, with the pandemic, it's been pretty hard. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to hang out rightfully. So, um, but I think it's really important to take time for yourself, especially if you're feeling burnt out, like you are number one. And if you can afford to take a nap, if you can afford to go on a walk or a run, um, eating well, like all that's going to benefit you so much. Um, so just knowing that, Hey, if, if I do this thing for myself, it'll make me so much better to do that next thing that I have to do. Um, and I've, I've, I'm becoming better at like making schedules, um, before I could, I don't know how, like, I would just like, remember everything I'd have to do, but now I can't do that. So making schedules, having like a planner where I write everything, like all of my random ideas. Um, cause those ideas you'll get, and then they'll go away. And if you don't write them down, like you'll, you'll forget. So, um, planner has really helped me a lot. And then just like prioritizing what's most important. Like, what do I have to get done today? And if I don't get it done, like it's, it's fine. It's not the end of the world. Um, but there's other things that you have to get done today. You have to study for your test tomorrow. It just is what it is. I do. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Probably why you're trying to get off. Yeah. So I think just like listening to yourself and like being nice to yourself, you know, like words of affirmation are so important. Mm -hmm. Um, just knowing that you have it in you to accomplish whatever it is that you want to do, but that you do have to make those little like baby steps to the bigger goal. Mm -hmm. Um, and not trying to just like overwhelm yourself with everything, like just make a plan. And I think that makes it more digestible for you to accomplish everything. For sure. I think that's it for the questions. Desiree, if you wanna close it up. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Vietta, for answering all the questions and for being here with us tonight. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks girls. Yeah, thank you so thank much. You. It was a great session. Yes, we really enjoyed it. And it was so nice to meet you. Um, everyone, the quiz is going to be up. Um, Dia will post it on the YouTube live stream chat, also the group meet, and you can also find it on our link tree. Thank you so much again, doctor. And everyone, everyone I hope you have a great night. Bye. Take care. <laughs>